Tonight's speaker is Fred Johnson. Most of you who have been here with us in other years are very familiar with him. Not only is he a professor at Hope College, he also is a military veteran. He served in the Marines as well as the Marine Reserves. He is a member of Toastmasters International, not just a member, but he advanced to the semifinal round in the World Series of Public Speaking six different times. Mm. And in two of those times, he was second place. So we're very grateful that he likes to speak here because we like to listen to him speak. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned about him recently, I don't think it's too old, he was given the highest, most prestigious honor that you can get from the Daughters of American Revolution. He received the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution Medal of Honor, which is given to an adult man or woman who was a U.S. citizen by birth and has shown extraordinary qualities of leadership, trustworthiness, service, and patriotism. He must have made unusual and lasting contributions to our American heritage by truly giving of himself to his community, state, country, and fellow man. So I think that's pretty impressive. So round yeah. of I warned him a little bit that I was going to take a little bit of his time. Okay. This is supposed to work for me. But maybe not. Last week we did the national anthem and I thought that was enjoyable. For me, I've just always been a person that really bonds with music, and America has a lot of military songs, patriotic songs, that maybe we don't get to hear as often as we should. Last week, we listened to the fabulous Go Green, Go White Michigan State Marching Band playing the national anthem, and as much as we all love Sparties all the time, even when they come in second place, <laughs> just in second, it's okay. But maybe we could try a different couple of different songs. So this week, kind of in keeping with what I think his theme is, and I've not heard his presentation before, but just the idea of acts of love in a time of war, things that make you feel uplifted during a time when maybe everything seems down. So I chose this one. It has a little bit of a um, history behind it, and then I'm going to play a little video for you. So the time was 1940. America was still in a terrible economic depression. Hitler was taking over Europe, and Americans were afraid we'd have to go to war. It was a time of hardship and worry for most Americans. This was the era just before TV when radio shows were huge and American families sat around their radios in the evenings, listening to their favorite entertainers, and no entertainer of that era was bigger than Kate Smith. Ah, yeah. Kate was also patriotic. It hurt her to see Americans so depressed and afraid of what the next day would bring. She had hope for America and faith in her fellow Americans. She wanted to do something to cheer them up, so she went to the famous American songwriter Irving Berlin and asked him to write a song that would make Americans feel good again about their country. When she described what she was looking for, he said he had just the song for her. He went to his files and found a song that he had written but never published 22 years before in 1917. He gave it to her, and she worked on it with her studio orchestra. She and Irving Berlin were not sure how the song would be received by the public, but both agreed they would not take any profits from God Bless America. Any profits would go to the Boy Scouts of America, and over the years the Boy Scouts have received millions of dollars in royalties from this song. Frank Sinatra considered Kate Smith the best singer of her time and said that when he and a million other guys first heard her sing God Bless America on the radio, they all pretended to have dust in their eyes as they wiped away a tear or two. To this day, God Bless America stirs our patriotic feelings and pride in our country. Back in 1940, when Kate Smith went looking for a song to raise the spirits of her fellow Americans, I doubt whether she realized just how successful the results would be for her fellow Americans during these years of hardship and worry, and for many generations of Americans to follow. So now that you know the story of the song, I'm going to run back there and play it. Hope you enjoy it. Feel free to sing along. I won't. <coughs> I'm going to sneak past you for just a second.
everybody. It is my happy privilege to introduce a new song. God bless America. <laughs> Makes you think of Blake, doesn't it? Makes you think of a lot of things. We're going to be in this yet, Mom. song out of Yip Yip Yap and 22 years ago. Sounds better now.
Thank you for indulging my love of music. <laughs> so now for tonight's presentation, I will turn it over to Fred and get him all set up with his slideshow. Right with that. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's good to be with you all again. Yes. Thank you. you too. What a great song. Yeah. To set the tone and the pace. Recording for, in progress. For what I'd like to share with you all this evening. A few years ago, I started putting together a series of presentations under the general heading of Acts of Love in Time of War. And by the way, speaking of that, there's a movie coming out, I think, in the very near, in the next month or two, entitled Devotion. It's about the rescue of Ensign Jesse Brown, or the attempted rescue of Ensign Jesse Brown, who was the first black African-American, African-American fighter pilot of the Navy, and his white wingmate, wingman, Tommy Hudner, who did, who voluntarily did a wheels up belly landing in the Korean Wars, right after the, the communists came in on the side of the North Koreans in 1950, and Tommy Hudner tried to rescue him. He didn't succeed, but he promised him, he said, I will come back for you. Mm -hmm. the, the helicopter from the aircraft carrier did come. They tried to get Jesse Brown out of his, air, out of his aircraft. Because it was nighttime, and because it was the coldest winter on record in Korea, and because the North Koreans were closing in fast, and the fuselage had buckled when Jesse Brown crashed, Tommy Hutner wasn't able to get him out of his aircraft. Helicopter comes. Sorry, he, the people want to see your Helicopter show. comes, and Tommy Hutner has to get on board the helicopter. They flew back to the aircraft carrier. Before he left, Jesse Brown said to him, tell Daisy I love her, Daisy being his wife. There's something we understand about men when it comes to telling other men to use their, the first name of their wife. You don't do that one man to another unless you are more than just casual friends. You are personal friends. Now, Tommy Hutner said, I'll come back for you. He didn't make it. Then into the future, he went on to become a full captain, retired from the Navy. He earned, he earned the Congressional Medal of Honor because of his attempt to get Jesse Brown. He then went on to work for the Veterans, the Veterans Administration in Massachusetts, where he was from. He retired from there as well. And then, as life continued getting on, and he started, started getting on at age himself, at the age of 88 years old, Tommy Hudner got permission from the North Korean government and the American, the American State Department to go back to Korea to try and bring home the bones of his friend. This is in 1950. This is before Emmett Till. It's before, the, it's before Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court case, they struck down school segregation. It's before the Montgomery City bus boycott. And every time I hear that story, I wonder, what was it that these two men, one black from Mississippi, the other one white from Massachusetts, what was it that they got right on friendship and respect for each other as human beings, thousands of miles away in Korea during wartime, that folk weren't getting right back here in America? It's coming out pretty soon. It's worth seeing. The name of the book is Devotion. The title of the movie is Devotion by Adam Makos. Because history is filled with so many stories of invasions and conquest and famine and just things going wrong and corruption and politicians who lie on a continuous basis, it is so refreshing on occasion to find a story that restores your faith in humanity through the vehicle of history. And this is what I found when I came across the name of Father Emma Kapan. As you saw there, the, the subtitle for this tonight is When Communists Had to Buy Before God. Now, you understand that communism, there are people inside of communist countries who believe in God, who are Christians and they have other faiths, but generally speaking, in most totalitarian communist nations, the ideology does not allow the existence of a, the existence of a religion because your God is the state. So therefore, they don't tolerate a belief in anything else you are supposed to be directing all your energy, all your belief, all your, all your faculties, everything you have into the betterment or the resources of the state. The individual doesn't really matter. But in this case, communists were forced to take a back seat 
because of this man right here, Father Emil Joseph Capon. Emil Joseph Capon was, placed, was from, a, from a place called Pilsen, Kansas. This is the church where he was once the pastor. Outside the church, there was, I don't know exactly if the sign is still there, but at least at one point, the sign you see here, it was St. John's Parish Church, Holy Family Parish, Pilsen, home of Father Emil Capon. Pilsen is a Czechoslovakian immigrant community that was founded in 1874. The first church was a two-story frame building. The second one, a frame building. Two second church was a frame building large enough to seat the entire congregation. In 1915, the third church was built. The, the current church has a, a, an adjacent rectory which houses a small, a small museum devoted to Father Emil Joseph Capon. You have to be concluding at this point that a town called Pilsner, Pilsner, Pilsner Kansas, Kansas is not going to be very big, but if the entire church has a rectory with a museum dedicated to Father Capon, this guy must have done something worth remembering. And he did. Father Capon grew up in the church and was briefly his pastor. And there are plenty of stories that the local community has about Father Capon. This is a view inside the church. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. <coughs> <laughs> one story was that one day when his mother, when his mother was ill and Capon attempted to milk a cow in her stead. The cow wouldn't stand, stand still for him, so he went back inside, put on one of his mother's dresses, and went back out to the cow, which now recognized him, and finally stood still long enough to be milked. So he literally had to put on his mother's clothing. This is Father Capon when he went into, well, Father Capon, but at this stage, seminary student Capon. When he was at the seminary, his friends would talk about how he was always there to help them out. He was a very good student. He would offer his notes if he was going to help one of his classmates out so that they might pass their classes. And this is Emil Capon and his mother Bessie prior to his ordination into the Catholic priesthood in 1939. You, of course, will know that 1939 is also the year that warfare broke out in Europe. On September 1, 1939, when the Wehrmacht rolled across the Polish frontier and the Germans took the, east, the western half of Poland and the Soviets took the eastern half of Poland as per the agreement of the August 22nd, 1939, Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. By 1940, you see Father Capon here playing baseball with school children. Father Capon was, if you'll bear with me as I read, Father Capon was ordained a priest on June 9th, 1940. He was assigned to his home parish, St. John, Nepomucene Parish, where children came to play with him at recess, or he played with them at recess. And then again in 1940, this is Father Capon right here, posing for a picture with members of his congregation after celebrating his first mass as a priest at St. John Nepomucene Church in Pilsen, Kansas. Now, it's important to establish context. What else is going on in the world in 1940? This is the year of the Blitz, the Battle of Britain. And there are many people in America who still don't want America to get involved in World War II. And many people who see the America's eventual involvement in World War II as a foregone conclusion. In other words, how can a nation as big as America, as tied to Northern Europe as we, as we are and were, stay out of that conflict? And then more than that, how can you let that kind of evil that the Nazis were inflicting upon people not go answered, but still not in the war yet? By 1942, America's in the war because of the, of the December 7th, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, and then the Nazis declare war on America four days later on December 11th, and now we're in war on two different fronts across two different oceans, finally in World War II. By 1942, here you see Father Capon celebrating mass for soldiers at Harrington Air Base in Kansas. It was after he saw the need for military chaplains while serving at Harrington Air Base that Father Capon felt the, felt the call to go to the, to go to the ministry, ministry as a chaplain. So, he enlisted, and he became second lieutenant, Emil Capon, right? Not too unusual, many uh, patriotic Americans did the same thing during that period. <clears throat> 1943, his father Capon in his military outfit with his parents, Elizabeth, Bessie, and Enos. Uh, 
1943, the United States was in one part of the war fighting at a place called Guadalcanal, Tulagai Gavavutu, in the Florida Islands. This was a really, really hard engagement, like most of, most of the Pacific fighting was. 1943 is also significant because the planner of the Pearl Harbor attack, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, in, August, in April 1943, this was the year, the month, the day of the year, when Admiral Yamamoto finally got his. An American flight of P-38 Lightnings, information intel was, was intercepted about Admiral Yamamoto, who's on, a, who's on a tour to the South Pacific to try and encourage Japanese soldiers whose morale was flagging, and American intel officers, intel officials, picked up the flight path of this, B, this Betty B bomber, and so they intercepted the aircraft, and the P-38 shut him down, and the planner of Pearl Harbor was finally gone onto eternity. In that same year, Emperor Hirohito, the man who supposedly was both God and man, he was said to have, he was quoted as saying that the situation for Japan is now very grave. I cannot stress to you how important it was as a sign of how things were changing for Japan that the emperor would say this. And because things were getting so desperate, in 1944, the Japanese unleashed a secret weapon called the kamikaze, translated as divine wind. The kamikazes were, as we understand them, to be suicide pilots. Some American military historians and strategists have said that if the Japanese had unleashed this earlier in the war, it may not have forestalled the war, it may not have changed the outcome of the war, but certainly American lives and the damage to American shipping, blood and treasure, would have been far in excess of what it was, and it was too much as it was based on this tactic. But by late in the war, Father Capon had transferred or serving in a part of the Pacific Theater called CBI, China Burma India Theater. China Burma India is still, is still considered <coughs> that part of World War II that not very many people know about. We know about the Pacific Theater, we know about the European Theater. But still not very many people know about this particular theater called CBI, China, Burma, India, where you have these American pilots and British pilots who spent the entire war flying over what they called the hump, the Himalayan mountain range. Now, no, it's not as glamorous as landing on beaches in the Pacific or D-Day landings on June 6, 1944, but what these pilots did in flying over the hump in the C-46 air, the C-46 commando, to com tremendous bravery. This was very an inhospitable weather, dangerous terrain as you obviously can see. If there's something goes wrong with the, with the airplane, there's no place to land as you can see. So the pilots had a motto, don't let anything go wrong with the airplane. <laughs> but these troops, the, these pilots and their air crews kept supplied British and American forces so they could continue fighting the Japanese in current B Burma, and that part in India, keep them tied down. So what that did effecti effectively was, it took nearly a million Japanese soldiers, or those Japanese soldiers who could have been transferred to other parts of the Pacific theater, were tied down in China. So strategically, those soldiers, which would have been elsewhere killing Americans in different island campaigns, were forced to fight in this area, and these airplanes kept those British and American and Burmese soldiers supplied so they could do that. And I just got to tell you, so we can expedite this, that there were crashes, and oftentimes the pilots and the crews knew that if they crashed, they were as good as dead. If the Japanese caught them, they were told just to commit suicide because they were going to be killed anyway. If you're, just for me for a moment, just some, just some bullet points about the Forgotten Theater of the War. Of the 12.3 million Americans under arms at the height of mobilization, only about a quarter of a million were assigned to the CBI. Relatively few Americans in combat were in the CBI. China Burma India's early importance was plans to, to base air and naval forces in China for, for an assault upon Japan. Early in World War II, the belief was that if we were going to invade, invade Japan, there was going to be a, an amphibious landing to invade the Japanese home islands or probably launch from China. Those plans changed as American fortunes in the Pacific got better and better, particularly at the Midway in 1942. Mostly British, Chinese, and Indian forces were engaged, engaged Japanese troops that could have been used elsewhere. So America's major contribution, 
war materials and manpower and air and land lift capability. The planes to fly the food, the beans, the butter, the band-aids, the bullets to the people that needed to use them on the ground. Army Air Forces flew supplies to China with our, well, Army engineers built the Lido Road to open up a land route and also went to Michina the airfield, which, will, which really brought a great deal of relief to the Chinese soldiers who are also doing their part in a great way. While there, Father Capon, there's one person right here, tech, tech, how, Technician 4 Howard Sherman, with an Italian missionary named Father Mongesi. Tech 4 Howard Sherman says, I've been helping Father Edward Glavin, Catholic chaplain, chaplain serve mass when he was in our area. He introduced me to Father Capon and we struck up a great friendship. When Father Glavin received orders to move out, Father Capon asked me to continue assisting at mass. We traveled to two missions in the area. We met a priest and nuns from Italy who had established missions in Laosio and Namtu, Burma. Not only did Father Capon minister to our troops, he also helped the local missions in many ways. He took up a collection among the troops and turned over a tidy sum of, to the missionaries. At his request, engineers went in and rebuilt a nice building for the mission for use as a church and a school. Father Mongesi, the missionary priest at Laosio, appreciated the help that Father Capon gave him. I continued to assist Father Capon when he was in our area. He had a, get this, he had a territory of 2,000 miles to cover from Lido to Laosio and did so mainly by Jeep. He enjoyed his beer and, and pipe. Now, I don't like Father Capon before reading that part, but when I read that part, I really liked it. <laughs> when we received our rations, we shared them with him. And there were times when he brought his rations to share with me and my buddies. Now, again, 2,000 miles of territory to cover in a place that is surrounded by or threatened constantly by the Japanese. And the Japanese, the Japanese army, did terrible, terrible things during World War II. These people are at war. And Father Capone is going around in a Jeep, ministering to people during a time of war. There are different levels and different types of courage. He's displaying a kind of courage that isn't the kind of nail-biting John Wayne type of storming a beach, but it is courage nonetheless. On August 6, 1945, you all know that the Enola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbetts, flew over Hiroshima, opened his bomb bay doors, and dropped an atomic bomb over Hiroshima, which was the first of two atomic bombs. The second one dropped on August 9, 1945, over Nagasaki. And then later on, those two bombs were the thing that did the final trick in ending, World War, ending the Pacific War and peace was supposed to come. It did for a moment. The newspaper headlines carried the news of the fantastic achievement of defeating the Japanese. And soon thereafter, the, on September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese delegation came aboard the USS Missouri, harbored or anchored in Tokyo Bay, and signed the surrender agreement here you see General Douglas MacArthur overlooking the signing ceremony. He's the Supreme Allied Commander in that area at the time, and he will go on to become the military governor of Japan. In fact, the Constitution that Japan has today is in large part, was in large part written by MacArthur, as the one that they continue to use today. There were people who urged MacArthur to remove the emperor. He resisted that. In fact, he told them no, he wasn't going to do it because understood that the emperor was not just a figurehead politically, he was a cultural symbol and icon. And many people credit MacArthur with being the one who prevented a civil war from starting in Japan, which just goes to show how much the emperor meant to people as a symbol. The reason why I say peace was supposed to happen is because, you know, I sometimes use the phrase, as the dust was settling in the smoke clearing, peace came so fast in Europe you probably have seen pictures of American and Russian soldiers who are embracing each other at the Elbe River toward the end of 1945, but May 1945, when Nazi Germany collapsed. And that was true joy at two unlikely allies, Americans from the world's biggest capitalist nation and Russians from the world's largest communist nation who had an alliance of necessity to defeat a lethal enemy. But however the alliance came together, 
Individual soldiers on the ground who are experiencing the hard weather, the hard living, the threat every day, they understand it's something that you don't need to speak the same language to be able to, to, to deal with, to identify with. So peace did come, but the moment of feel-goodism didn't last all that long. The Cold War started very quickly. As this, political, as this political cartoon communicates, the Cold War was, among other things, it was overshadowed for 45, 50 years by irresponsible statements and deepening suspicions. The Cold War is nothing else if not distrust, fear, and suspicion. Father Capon, still on active duty, had been promoted to captain, and continued to serve in the China Burma India Theater until May 1946 long after most Americans had gone, had gone home. Then he was released from active duty in July 1946. He also returned home, and like many American veterans of that day and time, decided to go to college on the GI Bill. He earned a master's degree in education in February 1948. He went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C., or as my colleagues, as one colleague of mine who went to the school, he said, it's not Catholic University, it's the Catholic University. <laughs> Excuse me, the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. <coughs> Father Capon, though, kept in touch with tech for, tech, te Technician 4 Howard Sherman, shown here on the left in that right panel. So I can read this for you. You see, they're letting here at the top, Reverend Emil J. Capon, Catholic University of, American, of America, Washington, D.C., January 1st, 1947. Your card and letter were really a joy to me for it is swell to hear from old friends. I sure am glad that you have a nice home in which you are living. Maybe after things get back to normal, your wish for a house of your own will be fulfilled. Yes, we sure hope that someday things will get to, get to normal again. Think about that, it's 1947 and people are still looking for things to settle down. Many thanks, Howard for the invitations to visit your folks. I'm going to try to accept the invitation, but I can't say when now, but when I do tend to visit, he essentially goes on to say that. He's glad, happy to stay in touch. He wants to, get, he wants to eventually visit these guys, visit um, Howard, but he's busy in school, and he signs up with, may this year 1947 be a blessed one and a successful one for all of you. Father Capon was clearly was proving himself to be a warm individual. So we're going to step over here. This letter must be short, Howard. God bless you and the whole family. And please, throw me, a, throw me a line again. I'll let you know when I'll be over to visit you. <laughs> I'll speak from back there. April 1948, Father Capon's bishop appointed him as pastor as a pastor in Tempton, Kansas. But Father Capon was still feeling a call to be a chaplain for the troops. So in September 1948, the bishop approved Father Capon to rejoin the army as a chaplain. So he ended up being a chaplain at Fort Bliss. Then in 1950, Father Capon was ordered to Japan. You know what's coming, right? Mm -hmm. June 25th, 1950, North Korea attacked South Korea. And Father Capon was, was assigned to a frontline combat unit, the 3rd Battalion, 8th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division.
Now, he's, he's kept in touch with technician for Howard Sherman. And in a letter, while he was attending a Catholic university, he wrote, Sherman said that he was planning to visit me at my home in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, when I had last corresponded with him because of his recall to his home area. He was unable to make the trip. I next heard him from, heard from him after he decided to go back to the Army Chaplain School. He wrote me from Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas, telling me of his decision and his desire to serve the troops once more during the Korean War. Shortly after Christmas 1949, I received a card from him telling me he was on his way to Japan. So there it was. North Korea attacked South Korea. This shows the 30th parallel where the two Koreans are split. <coughs> And of course, South Korea was an American ally. The North Koreans were allies of the, the, the Russians and the Chinese. As indicated on June 25th, 1950, North Korea attacked South Korea. This caught the world by surprise. At the, time, at the time when this attack occurred, the House Un-American Activities Committee was investigating people inside the United States for pro-communist activity or pro-communist spy activity. So when North Korea attacked South Korea, Father Kapon was assigned to a frontline combat unit. Tell you what, what? I'll marry from back here. So the North Korean advance across the Yalu River is one of the better maps I found that actually shows the North Korean movement. The North Koreans advanced so fast, their, their attack was so surprising, it caught the South Koreans off guard in the American Islands off guard, that they were pushed down into something called the Fusan Perimeter. Now, back in Washington, President Truman ordered General MacArthur, military governor in Japan, to begin planning a counterattack, and MacArthur chose as a place to have a counterattack the port city of Incheon. Incheon was the absolute worst place that MacArthur could have chosen for the following reasons. His assistants told him that to plan and a proper amphibious operation would take five to six months. That's if you're going to plan one with you have good lead time and have everything going for, going for you, and they did not. MacArthur was giving them only one month. The Joint Chiefs of Staff worried that because of the great situation of the, the Pusan perimeter, he wouldn't be able to keep, keep enough units to fight elsewhere and might be defeated in both places. Also, the Incheon Beach Line had every disadvantage for amphibious operations. Unpredictable tidal variation, approximately 10 meters, 30, me 30, 30 meters, 30 feet plus or minus in variation in the tides. Not to mention, variations allowed at best use of beaches for like six hours out of every 24. So one quarter of every 24 hours would be available for the landing. And then the only approach to the port of Incheon was through a narrow, torturous channel blocked by a key harbor defense site. The Incheon port facilities were inadequate for supporting a major operation. So think about this. No time for proper planning. No good lead time. Channelized approach. Guns on each side. Tidal variations of 30 feet plus or minus. And only six hours out of every day that you can use to plan for a good landing. MacArthur said, essentially, it's the worst place to land. And the, the North Koreans will know that too, which is why we're going to go there. MacArthur said, the only alternative to a stroke such as I propose will be the continuation of the savage sacrifice we are making at Pusan with no hope of relief in sight. Are you content to let our troops stay in that bloody perimeter like beef cattle in the slaughterhouse? Who will take, resp take the responsibility for such a tragedy? Certainly I will not. The people on his staff did not have a good answer, so guess what they did? They landed at Incheon. They landed at Incheon, 
and it turned out to be a stunning success. They cut the North Korean advance off, cut them off of the supply line. The North Koreans had to go not only back across the 38th parallel, but they went dashing toward the Yalu River, which was the contiguous border shared by North Korea and China. Now, after a while, the North Koreans, the North Koreans recovered, and as the Americans kept getting closer and closer and closer to the Chinese border, in some cases, every now and then there would be a bombing mission that would go across the border, the Chinese began sending messages, threats through back channel through an Indian diplomat that if the Americans did not move away from the Yalu River and move south of the 38th parallel, that they were coming on the side of the North Koreans. And this is toward the end of 1950. The Americans did not heed their advice, did not heed their warning. The Chinese came in on the side of North Korea. You see here, August 11, 1950, where all that drama was going on diplomatically, Father Gapan is is, in his, is over there doing his duty, conducting a field mass on the hood of his Jeep. Another picture of Father Capon. Father Capon loved to ride around on his bicycle. Then came the Battle of Unsan, November 1st, 1950. From 1 through 2 November 1950, the regiment was subjected to a relentless attack. In the early morning hours, the enemy succeeded in breaking through Head-to-head -head combat in immediate vicinity of the command post where the aid station had been set up. Father Capon calmly moved along the line of wounded men, giving them medical aid and easing their fears. He inspired all those present and many men who fight might otherwise have fled in panic were encouraged by his presence and remained to fight the enemy. This is an utterly amazing picture here. This picture right here shows Father Capon and another officer assisting a wounded soldier. You see Father Capon there on the far right and a doctor carrying an exhausted soldier off a battlefield in Korea early in the war. The photo shows Capon to the GI's left. The soldier on the GI's right was Captain Jerome A. Dolan, a medical officer with the 8th Cavalry Regiment. Don't you wonder how somebody took this picture? This is full-scale combat going on here. And somehow they captured this image. And Father Emil Capon and look, don't let me oversell this point. I have never been to combat. I've almost been, which is about as close as I ever want to get. But I've been told by combat veterans, mainly Vietnam veterans, that when you're in combat, and somebody like Father Capon is there, speaking a kind word, a calm word, that does wonders for settling you down, even though you may know the end is coming for yourself. A calm voice in the midst of all that chaos. That's what Father Capon is offering these soldiers at that particular moment. He's there doing that. The battle got worse. The wounded were increasing in number. Many wouldn't be able to escape the encirclement. So the, the North Koreans had them encircled. And then, at dusk, on November 2nd, 1950, the able-bodied men, the able-bodied men, the orders came from on high, that the able-bodied men were to break through the surrounding enemy and Chaplain Capon stayed behind. Let me make sure we understand this. Somebody in charge saw that the battle was not going well. So they gave the order for the able-bodied men to leave the wounded and disabled behind. In order for the rest of the able-bodied men to break through. Father Capon could have gone with them. He voluntarily stayed behind with the wounded and the disabled, knowing they were surrounded and knowing they were going to probably more than likely be captured. Chaplain Capon stayed behind. He was last seen giving medical treatment and rendering religious rites wherever it was needed. Are you prepared to call him the hero yet? Mm. Yeah. Father Capon and others were captured by the Chinese and the North Koreans and marched north in bitterly cold winter weather. And you all recall what I said to you earlier at the start of this about Ensign Jesse Brown and Tommy Hudner? This particular winter in Korea was at that time the coldest winter on record. I talked to other Marines who have served in, who have served in Korea. They said that Korea doesn't just get cold. They say it gets cold. <laughs> so Korea gets really, really cold. And this was the coldest winter they recorded on, recorded on record. Herbert Miller, 
a soldier, wounded with a broken angle, said after the war, I was wounded with a broken angle and the North Koreans were going to shoot me. Father Kapan brushed him aside, reached down and picked me up and carried me. How he found the strength, I'll never know. He was the bravest man I ever saw. One account he goes like this. Herbert Miller was laying on the ground, broken ankle, can't walk. A Chinese soldier or a North Korean soldier came up and put his barrel down in Miller's face. Father Kapal walked up to this guy, took the barrel of the weapon, and moved it out the way. And so you're not going to shoot him. And this communist soldier looked at him and said something, and then walked away. And Miller survived the war because of that one act of Father the Kapan. Something's going on there that's not the realm of what I call normal. <laughs> Father Kapan and his fellow TPOWs were taken to a temporary camp called the Valley. During the first in a series, those, that, the valley was the first in a series of camps to eventually be, be held. And out of approximately 1,000 Americans, 500 to 700 of them died. Chinese prisoner of war camps at this time, the, the survival rate statistics were 40% worse than Japanese POW camps during World War II, which approximately one third of all Allied prisoners perished. Scholars of the silver sides. What they're saying is that these Chinese POW camps were worse than what people experienced at Cabana Tuan, after the Bataan Death March, some of the worst atrocities of World War II during the Pacific Philippine campaign. And the, and the Japanese had a lot of practice and a lot of time to do some terrible, terrible things. But here it is. This is just the first few months of the war, and the Chinese are already beating the Japanese when it comes to cruelty and sacrifice. Men needed food. Many men were starving. Father Capon scavenged nearby fields for potatoes and corn, and he knew that if he was discovered, he could be shot on sight. He did it anyway. And keep in mind, it's freezing cold out there. Father Capon shared his food. And, he, and for, for those soldiers who were hoarding food, he, he frankly shamed the ones who were hoarding food. And he gave them hope. Father Capon prayed with them. He joked with them. Tended the sick and the buried. He, he tended to the sick and buried the dead. The Chinese captors started mandatory re-education classes about the glories of. They were supposed to be focused. They were just focused upon the glories of communism. But Father Capon fought calmly, ignored the lessons. The Chinese were enraged, and word spread, and word began to spread among the American soldiers that the Chinese communists were afraid of Father Capon. One of the Father Capon's fellow prisoners recalled after the war, in his soiled and ragged fatigues with his scraggly beard and his queer woolen cap, made of the sleeve of an old GI sweater pulled down over his, his ears, he looked like any half-starved prisoner. But there was something in his voice and bearing that was different, with dignity, a composure, a serenity, that radiated from him like a light. Whenever he stood, wherever he stood was holy ground, and the spirit within him, a spirit of reverence and abiding faith went out to the silent listening men and gave them hope and courage and a sense of peace. Now, the Chinese are back in this effort at this point, but they're not actually in the war. November 26, 1950, the Chinese actually formally come in, and they come in in mass. And the Chinese soldiers, just to make sure we understand this, the Chinese army at this point, this is not some untried, untested army, this is the same Chinese or communist army that's been fighting against the Japanese partly before World War, during World War II, and also against Chiang Kai-shek for, for a good length of time before World War II. The only reason why the Chiang Kai, why the nationalists of the Kuomintang and Mao Zedong's communists quit fighting each other was because they had to turn around and fight the Japanese. Once the Japanese were defeated, they went back to fighting each other until 1949. These guys beat the Kuomintang and pushed them on to Taiwan where the Kuomintang exists today. So the PRC that's, exist, that's threatening China, I mean, Taiwan today, same PRC, People's Republic of China, different people obviously, but ideologically, regime-wise, Taiwan still the Kuomintang, the PRC is still descended from this particular event here. The 
Chinese came in, and there, there were at this point in the war rumors that there's a, a popular feeling among American troops that they were going to be home by Christmas. But then the Chinese came in, and the war dragged into late 1950, 1951, 1952, 1953, until they had to sign a ceasefire, which means exactly what it says. A ceasefire means exactly what it says. It means that I won't shoot at you if you don't shoot at me. Today, right now, as I speak to you, that ceasefire remains in force. We have no peace treaty, so we are still technically in a state of war with North Korea, which is why the, what I call the marshmallow every now and then, will fire off a missile over, China, over Japan and have tantrum trying to scare the world with his nuclear toys. The Battle of Children Reservoir was one of the more memorable, miserable events of the early part of the Korean War. You can see here the suffering of American GIs in the coldest winter on record. At the Battle of Children Reservoir, excuse me, this is where the American legend, legendary Marine Chessie Puller, Louis Burwell Puller, his name Chessie Puller, was told, General, they have us surrounded. He said, good, now we know what direction they wish to attack. But they eventually break out of the Chosen Reservoir. But while all that's going on, keep in mind, Father Capon is still a prisoner with his fellow soldiers. The Chinese tortured two officers, trying to get them, trying to get them to accuse Father Capon of having a bad attitude. They resisted. Father Capon, Father Capon told the tortured men, "Don't take the risk for me." He maintained disdain for the men. Dysentery, dysentery, a waterborne or a, a disease of the uh, of, of the bowels was ravaging through the camp because they had poor sanitary conditions. Father Capon cleaned and tended to the sick. He often led men in prayers and food. And he, get this, 1951 St. Patrick's Day, prayers for getting liver. He said prayers for getting liver. The next day they got liver from the captors. The same day they prayed for tobacco. The Chinese, the Chinese strictly forbade religious services. But Father Capon ignored them. So in 1951, Easter Sunday, Father Capon held Easter Sunday services for his men. They built a crude wooden cross with a rosary he had made from barbed wire around the camp. And they say he gave an unforgettable sermon. But things were not looking good for Father Capon. He had dysentery, pneumonia, and infected leg. Can I tell you all something? One of those would be enough to fail me. He's got dysentery, pneumonia, and a bad leg. The next Sunday, Father Capon collapsed while, reading, while leading another service. The communists refused to give him medical care. Why? Because it's not just enough sometimes to kill an individual. You have to make sure that the death is slow and torturous and painful as possible. So Father Capon, dying a cruel and really unnecessarily painful death, he said that he was sharing the tears of Christ in his suffering. The Chinese guards took Father Capon to the so-called hospital, which was just a shack where people were left to die, threw him in there on the dirt floor, where he, for three days, lay there, half naked, completely unattended. Again, I'll say it again. In the coldest winter on record in Korea. On May 23, 1951, Father Emil Capon died. The communists then dumped his body to a mass grave on the bank of the, La the Yalu River. Now, the forces of war would not change for the Americans. But what, what eventually happened was that Father Capon's heroism of service was recognized later on during the Obama, during the Obama administration when he was given the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously. Part of the citation of the award reads as follows. When the surviving prisoners were released at the end of the war, they came out with the story after story of the deeds of the man they had all loved to call father no matter what their religion. These men who survived, when they finally were released and came home, and I don't know how many years or those decades that it took them to get over the trauma to talk about it, but one after another of them told the story of this Catholic priest named Amo Capon, who had given up himself and literally poured himself out to save their lives and ease their comfort during a time of great distress. The armistice was signed, which I mentioned to you all just a moment ago, still holds in force today, thankfully. We will live through a period, of that period called the domino effect, where people thought that if 
Mainland China fell, then all of Korea would go, the Korean Peninsula, then Vietnam would go, then Laos and Cambodia, Thailand, then Burma, then India. To some extent, the planners back then weren't wrong. They just weren't as wrong as things eventually played out to be. Not all those areas fell to communism, some of them to military dictatorships, but we definitely will fight a war in Vietnam. There is in Washington, D.C. and around the country a war memorial to the Korean War veterans. Korean War veterans, those who are still, who we are blessed to still have among us, they refer to their conflict as the Forgotten War. We still do not know enough about the Korean conflict, how we got into it, how it was resolved, and more especially, what happened during that conflict, air war, land war, relations between the two Koreas, how we got that thing in the first place. On April 11th, 2013, Father Gapan was finally awarded a Medal of Honor. Please bear with me as I read from the citation. Chaplain Abel J. Gapan was, while assigned to Headquarters Company, 8th Cavalry Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division, distinguished himself by extraordinary heroism, patriotism, and selfless service between November 1st and 2nd, 1950. During the Battle of Ansan, Gapan was serving with the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Cavalry Regiment. As Chinese Communist forces encircled the battalion, Kapan moved fearlessly from foxhole to foxhole under direct enemy fire in order to provide comfort and reassurance to the outnumbered soldiers. This after his command, the higher command told people, the able-bodied, to move out and leave their wounded behind. Abel Kapan repeatedly exposed himself to enemy fire to recover wounded men, dragging them to safety. When he couldn't drag them, he dug shallow trenches to shield them from the enemy. Scholars of silver size, keep in mind, this is all happening while they're being shot at. People are trying to kill this man while he's doing all this stuff. As Chinese forces closed in, Father Emil Kapan rejected several chances to escape. Rejected several chances to escape, instead volunteering to stay behind and care for the wounded. He was taken as a prisoner of war by Chinese forces on November 2nd, 1950. Captured, captured, he was captured. Kapan and the other soldiers, prisoners were marched for several days northward toward prisoner or war camps. During the march, Kapan led by example in caring for injured soldiers, refusing to take a break from carrying the stretchers of the wounded while encouraging others to do their part. Once inside the dismal prison camps, Kapan risked his life by sneaking around the camp after dark, foraging for food, caring for the sick, and encouraging his fellow soldiers to sustain their faith and their humanity. On at least one occasion, he was brutally punished for his disobedience, being forced to sit outside in sub-zero weather without any garments. When the Chinese instituted a mandatory re-education program, Father Kapan patiently and politely rejected every theory put forth by the instructors. Later, he openly flouted, that is, made fun of his captors by conducting a sunrise service on Easter Monday, 1951. Not necessarily make fun of, but certainly disobeyed them openly. <coughs> when Kapan began to suffer from the physical toll of his captivity, the Chinese transferred, to, transferred him to a filthy, unheated hospital where he died alone. In other words, they transferred him to some place, since he wasn't dying fast enough, he transferred him to some place where they were guaranteed his death would come a lot faster. As he was being carried to the hospital, he asked God for God's forgiveness for his captors and made his fellow prisoners promise to keep their faith. Chaplain Gapan died in captivity on May 23, 1951. Chaplain Emil J. Gapan repeatedly risked his own life to save the lives of hundreds of fellow Americans. His extraordinary courage, faith, and leadership inspired thousands of prisoners to survive hellish conditions, resist enemy indoctrination, and retain their faith in God and country. His actions reflect the utmost credit upon him, the 1st Cavalry Division, and the United States Army. As I mentioned, the ceremony took place at the White House in 2013. Then I believe it's 1993, Captain Chaplain Emil Kapan was declared a servant of God by Pope John Paul II. The canonization process of this selfless priest is underway. The simple priest from a little farm in Kansas is truly an inspiration for us all, so the citation went on to me, went on to read. So scholars of the silver sides, 
as it turns out. There was evil and there was good. I'm not talking about Hollywood evil. I'm talking about real evil in the world and real good in the world. Real evil represented by the communists on the battlefield and the real good being represented by Father Chaplain Abel J. Capon. It turned out that there was a book of truth and fantasy. It turned out that there was a light of redemption available and a hope for redemption. And Father Capon fulfilled all those expectations of what we expect from someone who's going to be properly included as someone who commits acts of love in a time of war. Father Capon was known to say often, do not fear your executioner, but prove yourself worthy of your brothers. From the second book of Maccabees, again repeated by Chaplain Amo Capon, to his fellow soldiers just before his death in a communist prison camp. Scholars of the Silver Sides, I like to tell you that I'm that kind of a good human being, but I'm not so sure that that's what I'd be saying about my captors on my way to death in that kind of a situation. Abel Capon was a different kind of human being, a different kind of American, a different kind of Medal of Honor winner. He is one of many people that I found who committed, who committed acts of love in a time of war. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Yes, sir. When did you, excuse me, when did you first encounter the, the story of, of Father? You know what? That's a good, when did I first encounter the story of Father Capon? I was kind of going through the internet one day looking for these kind of stories. And it popped up on a, on a standard Google search. I Frankly, it didn't have to look all that far. And I actually ordered the book all online. It's not that thick, but I was, I was just stunned that Father Capon's story was a, wasn't more well known. Somebody who's written a book about him and people out of Pills in Kansas, they know about him. But I'm of the attitude that everyone should know about this guy. Really. I did this subject at, at, at Hope College we have there's a course we, that we had called Senior Seminar, where seniors spend a whole semester uh, studying stuff on, you know, it's re reflective life issues, life issues, career issues, vocational issues. And when we went completely remote in 2020 because of the pandemic, they needed extra, extra instructors to teach one. So I figured, you know, why not? They were paying, so why not? Yeah. And I had the students look into this, actual love in, during time of war, and what the, the, the things that we found out were so, it, they were just so moved by it, they had never heard of these kind of things. And they, so, so one of them said to me, well, what, what, what makes you so interested in this? I said, because war, war whatever we do it, whatever we do warfare, it doesn't matter if it's in the, the, the Stone Age or the, the medieval period, the early modern period, the modern period, whenever, whenever human beings do war, it is the worst thing we can do in that moment. Now, 100 years from now, war will be different, but in that 100 years from now, when they do it, it's gonna be the worst thing they can do in that moment. If we do it right now, it's the worst thing we can do right now. There's nothing more evil, destructive, or harmful than human beings can do in a given moment, their warfare, whenever it occurs. And so with that being the case, with war being, having that much violence, that much just concentrated evil, in that kind of activity, particularly modern warfare, like World War II, World War I, where you take the economy, the best of metallurgy and chemistry and biology and science and, and just channel it all into one activity, warfare, to find this kind of humanity under those conditions <coughs> is worth investigating. Because if you can find people that do this, when we're, when, as a species, we're doing that, those are individuals that we need to take a, take a note from. They are the ones that Abraham Lincoln talked about in his first inaugural address when he mentioned the better angels of our nature. This is a better angel of our, of our nature. That's why he fascinates me and some other ones as well. But look at, look at Father Capon. Doesn't he just look like a good guy? <laughs> other questions or comments? What are your reactions about to this guy? Certainly makes you feel 
feel like people who complain about, oh, how hard it is to carry a backpack across a campus parking lot on a cold day, not so hard of a life, is it? Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, what this gentleman did was just, you know, wasn't going to end. And like you said, to be able to pray for the people who were torturing not only you, but the people you cared about around you is just... And he did it, like, so I, I mentioned several times, he did this on the coldest winter in record, on record in Korea. I, you know, I've been up here, I have presented to, to the Silver Sides audience and scholars during the winter time. And I complained from the front door to my car <laughs> about the cold in Muskegon, not to mention the coldest winter on record in, in Korea. So, yeah. Yes, sir. I'll say something about winter in Korea. I was a merchant marine after I left the Navy. And I had a, uh, one job where I was a officer on a tanker that resupplied all the military bases in Japan, Korea, mm -hmm. and Okinawa. So we gardened back and forth, resupplied the aviation fuels and all that to all these places. Yeah. And we were in, in one winter in Korea, and one winter in Korea, it was, I, you're standing in the deck, and, and I'm from Minnesota. And, it, and, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I went through all of this other stuff, and I could not believe how cold it was. And you look at the temperature, and it was like, you know, 17. You're like, 17? That's it? It feels like it's 30 below. It just hits you so hard there. I don't yeah. know how it is. Everything was cold. Three pairs of socks on in your boots. You're walking on a deck, and your feet are freezing. I mean, when people talk about cold, when they talk about cold during the Korean War, I, I think I have a better understanding of it than a lot of people. It's 38th parallel. We're thinking, well, that's not very far north. San Francisco's 30. Nine, I think, mm -hmm. and it's like, but it's cold. Yes, it's cold. Yeah. Well, you're from Minnesota, and and you've been spent spent time in Chicago too. Grew up, I grew up in Chicago, yeah. If you think it's cold, I believe you. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. It was one of the coldest spots I've ever been, and I couldn't believe how cold it felt. Yeah, I had to I had to read the citation on Father Capon several times just to, just to. Just to you know, just to try to comprehend comprehend the excellence of this man as a human being. Never mind as a soldier, just as a human being. Yes, sir. Oh, you have that? Okay. But there's well, there's him, and there's so many more. Yes. How many chaplains roughly got Medal of Honors? You know, there's been a number of them. I, I knew there there's been a number of them. One, but do you are you all familiar with a movie that came out about maybe five, six years ago? By a guy who was a conscientious objector in the Pacific Theater, mm -hmm. and I think his name was Desmond something. Desmond, no. He he did want to he didn't he wanted to serve his country, but he didn't want to carry a weapon. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, it was made into a movie, and I, I can't remember the movie, but that's worth seeing. But there have been a number of chaplains who have gotten the Medal of Honor, and you know, you know who else? A number of Navy, Navy, Navy corpsmen, medical yeah. personnel that have gotten the Medal of Honor. Well, that I'm familiar with. I knew one. Yeah. If you know anything about Navy corpsmen, the guys that work with the Marine Corps and uh, combat units, <laughs> those are some of the toughest guys. They're frankly as tough or tougher than the Marines they serve with. <laughs> those Navy corpsmen, those guys, those guys, <laughs> they're just there. Of course they are. They're Navy. <laughs> 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 Score one for the Navy. <laughs> well, well, okay. You know, one thing I know about cold weather, I have a nephew who's born and raised in Orlando, Florida. Spent a lot of his time in Miami where his relatives were. He just this year got a job working for the Minnesota Vikings. And I just want to go gawk at him on that first winter because <laughs> he bought some coat and gloves and boots in Florida for his winter in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend of mine who's living, who just, she just moved to, North Carolina, to Winston Salem, North Carolina, and she was talking about last winter. She said, I can't believe how, she's from New York City originally. She said, I can't believe how people down here just react when they hear about, just hear a weather report about snow. And so what I remember from Camp Lejeune, that being from, not that I'm not from, not from Minnesota or Chicago, but when I got to Camp Lejeune, especially in the rural areas, and people even heard about the possibility of frost, they would just drive into a tree and get it over with. <laughs> you know, they're really not equipped to handle snow down there. You all have been wonderful as usual. Thank you for allowing me to borrow some of your time. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be here again next week with another story that I'm sure will make us all 
re-examine our own priorities and values in life too. Thank you for coming, and yeah. if you have any other questions, Thank I know sometimes he's more than willing to chat one-on-one -on -one with you if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.